Well, good morning, everyone. We've been a long morning. I hope uh, you've enjoyed it. And for the next 25 minutes, I'll be talking about our digital transformation journey, how it changes the way we work at EDP Generation, and how that uh, has played a role in that. But before that, I would like to show you a video about EDP's ambition of positioning itself as a leader in the uh, energy transition that must happen in the coming decade. I really love this video and seeing it on the screen is just simply amazing. So who is EDP? We are a Portuguese company. Uh, we are headquartered in Portugal, but we are also a multinational company. We have a strong presence in Portugal, Spain and Brazil with our generation assets, but our renewable energy company, EDPR, which is also here today, uh, they have also a strong presence in North America and other European countries. We are about 12,000 employees. Um, and we have a significant gigawatts of installed capacity. I just got to notice that uh, we are ranked first on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index in Integrated Utilities. So sustainability is part of our DNA, and we also have our sustainability objectives as part of the United Nations program. We are a vertically integrated utility. We are present across the whole value chain with assets in renewables, with assets in networks, transmission and distribution, and also in retail energy. And we have a significant number of clients. We have about 11 million customers in uh, electricity and gas, and more than 70% of our installed capacity is in renewables. It is important for us, as, ambition, as our ambition to be leaders in the energy transition, that we have more renewable um, energy assets in our portfolio. But we still have a very strong footprint in natural gas and coal, essentially in Portugal, Spain, and also in Brazil, we have a coal power plant. Last year, we generated about 70 ter terawatts of electricity, which is a lot for a company of our dimension. And now I'll tell you a little bit about EDP generation, or EDP Produção, its name in, in Portuguese. That's the, the business unit I work for, and we have a long history in generation as our origins date back to the 50s, when the first dams were built in Portugal. 
We have a significant number of hydropower plants, but we also have combined cycle power plants in the coal generation, uh, a coal unit generation unit in Portugal that dates back to the 80s. We are about the southern employees, um, and we recently finished a large hydro expansion project where we built eight new projects in Portugal. This chapter is finished right now. We're not growing anymore, at, at least not in large hydro projects in Portugal. And so we are changing our focus from growing or from expanding our portfolio to optimizing our portfolio in making it more efficient. That's why we've been working so much on the digital front, on seeing how can we take more from our assets, how can we sweat our assets, our assets without breaking them. And that's why I'm going to talk you, to you um, or to talk to you today about the role of, of data in our digital transformation journey. But I, I think it's important that, I mean, uh, we are talking a lot about digital and digital and what is our strategy for digital. But digital in itself is not an end. I mean, we all need to have a strategy of what we want to do with these new digital technologies. But in the end, this is just a piece in the company strategy. It's one more enabler that we have to help us go forward. It's an enabler with steroids, it's true. It's very powerful, but still it's an enabler. Because most of us who are sitting here today, we still work in brick and mortar industries. We need physical factories, we need physical assets. We need to understand the physical process of what's going on. So let's not forget the place of digital. It can help us a lot, but we also need the physical part of the business. So our journey started a long time ago. Um, we started in the late 80s, 90s, renovating our power plants when we started building some automation figures in them. Uh, we were discussing our first Pi system dates back to, the, to 2006, but our first Pi server is from 1998 in our coal power plant. So we've been collecting data for a long time. But in 2006, we made a shift. What did we do? We collected the, the data from all of our power plants and made them available in one single place that we called Skipper, a global network of energy. That's the, the logo that you see on, on the right. And by doing this, we democratized the access to the information because by then, the information was owned by the plant manager. The plant manager was the one decided to whom he wanted to share the information with. Some people could not get access to the information, not mentioning the fact that the real-time data was printed on paper, was not even available on, on our PCs. So it didn't make much sense that we continue to go that way. And so what we did was that we democratized access to the information, we made it available to everyone. And we had the support of the Pi system to do that. And why did we do this? Because data is at the core of everything. Data is what helps us understand what is in front of us. So we had to collect the data, look at it, and see if it makes sense. Because if I gather data, but it doesn't make sense, it's just nice. I can't do anything with it. And so we had the data, but how could we get access to it? How could it be available to everyone? And so. We designed an infrastructure with um, uh, distributed servers that collected the data to one single place, and in that single place, people could get access. Because if I have the data, if it's useful, but if I don't get access to it, again, nobody can do anything with it. But also, the fact that we have a significant number of variables and of information that is generated and needs to make sense. We need to find a way to organize this information. We need to find a way that this information or that this data makes sense. And that's where data quality gets in. So we have the data. We have to make sure that it makes sense. How can I make sure that it is correct? How can I make sure that my real-time data, because that's what we're talking about, is real-time data. How can I make sure that this real-time data is correct? So, we did three things. The, two, the first two are on this slide. 
we started developing some algorithms, some internal alg algorithms that validate the information automatically, and we partner also with some external companies that help us validate this kind of information in real time. Because again, the challenge is, if I'm producing and consuming this data in real time, how can I make sure that it is correct? How can I make sure that my analysis have the correct data? The other one is that we still have, in some cases, validation done by, by some of our colleagues. Why? Because when I need to share information, especially with external parties, they ne we need to make sure that this information is correct. And so we have also a human factor in this. This is not just a machine thing, it's also a human thing. We have some of our colleagues who are experts in the subject. They look at the data and they validate it. They see if it makes sense. And that's the third component of our data quality part. But again, I have the quality, I have the information. It is correct, but is it accessible or not? Do people get access to it? Do people get access to the data? Do the ones who understand what the data means get access to it? How do we do this? So first, what we did was that we kept uh, making the information available uh, in our data lake. The Skipper is, uh, that is our data lake. Uh, we built it since 2006, as I mentioned before, at the time that nobody was talking about AI, machine learning, or advanced analytics. And we did it because it made sense. It made sense for us to do it. So traditionally, we have uh, the information available through our desktop PCs. But the truth is that today, as a society, we are moving to mobility. We spend even more time, ever time, every day we spend more time looking at our smartphones, as we can see here in the audience. I bet that some of you spend more time looking at your smartphones than sitting at your desks and running analysis on your PCs. So we had to make this information available also in in a mobile version. That's the slide that you see here in the middle. This is a mobile um, application that we've developed where you can have access to real-time information. And any employee can get access to the company's information in real time. It's like having the whole generation in your hands. It's really powerful. It's really intuitive. And I mean, it's the future. You do it in, in mobile. And again. We went one level above. We are actually, uh, I have a video about that. We have uh, doing some pilots with augmented reality devices with Microsoft HoloLens. And the image that you see in the far right is an image of Pi Vision in one of these devices. We actually integrated Pi Vision in Microsoft HoloLens. And now our technicians in the field get, get access to real time information while they are performing their tasks. Imagine you are face to face with a problem and you can see what's going on. You can see real time what's going on. So data has to be accessible. If it's not accessible, it's useless. And now I'll tell you a little bit about some of the projects that we believe will transform the way we work, because in the end, I mean, in the end, why we do this because we want people to change the way we work. We want them to use more of their brain power and to do their tasks instead of just doing admin stuff. So the first one, the one in the left, is our workforce management platform. What we did was that we started doing some, um, how can I explain it to you? We used to do um, our work orders on paper, and now we do it automatically in the system. We just in insert it in the system, and it's done. We have the, the HoloLens project, which is a quite interesting one, but it's still in its infancy. We have the um, mobile version of our um, real-time data, and we are also developing, or more than developing, we are implementing in a monitoring and diagnostic center that uses real-time uh, data for their advanced analytics and predictive maintenance. So it's been a lot of work that we've been doing at TDP Generation. And now I'd like to show you a video that illustrates this, and I hope that works as an inspiration for some of your projects.
tecnologia dos HoloLens é um meio que, que facilita a introdução daquilo que se chama a realidade aumentada. É providenciar novos meios para dar suporte aos nossos colegas, essencialmente na área da operação e manutenção. Esta tecnologia vem nos trazer diversos benefícios. Uma delas é a análise histórica diretamente no equipamento e também o fornecimento de uma plataforma em que nos permite termos, durante a reparação do equipamento, manuais, visualização do estado online do equipamento e de restantes variáveis. Em termos de otimização de trabalho, há aqui três ou quatro grandes uh, pontos que nós consideramos que são vantagens. Em primeiro lugar, a assistência remota, uh, que hoje em dia é muito importante e acaba por ser um meio muito eficiente de, de prestar ajuda uh, aos colegas que estão efetivamente perante determinadas situações em que precisam de auxílio. Posso dar o exemplo, por exemplo, do esvaziamento do circuito hidráulico, em que os técnicos eh, que estavam a fazer o, a atividade estavam a ver online o estado do, do poço, o estado de esvaziamento do circuito hidráulico, estavam a ver variáveis em que ajudava na sua atividade. Com isso, conseguimos otimizar o nosso processo e na tomada de decisões diretamente no local. Depois, há aqui outra grande expectativa, que é a possibilidade de ter vários campos de visualização, em termos imagens ou esquemas de como é que um determinado equipamento funciona e conseguir observar isso enquanto estamos a mexer, porque temos as mãos livres. E por outro lado, poder disponibilizar outros meios multimédia, como vídeos, por exemplo, ou até situações em que os próprios colegas gravam modos de trabalho e criam bases de conhecimento para poderem utilizar e partilhar com outros colegas. Well, I must say that this is this is a real video that, uh, of the wearables project that we are implementing at EDP Produção, and it's currently implemented uh, in our first two dam in the Douro River. So this is one part of our journey. But are we finished? Is our journey finished? No, it's not. I believe that the journey is never finished. We always have something else to go and something else to do. But I believe that we need to have an holistic view of these projects. We have to understand how they combine. We can build them as separate Lego bricks, but this doesn't make sense if they are not combined together to give a greater output if you want to. So what we are doing right now, for example, we are combining our workforce management platform with our wearables devices, and we call it our mobility ecosystem. Why? Because we believe that together they are stronger and are more useful to our colleagues in the field. Because let's not forget that the people in the field are the ones who use these solutions. They are the ones who buy these solutions. And we need to partner with them if we want to sort their problems, if we want, if we want to help them work better and work in a different way. The other thing that we are doing also is that we are implementing an end-to-end -end project management uh, application so that we can manage a project from the beginning, from its early days, for, from, from the beginning to the warranty issue management and to their maintenance. We need to have a complete view of what's going on. And also, for example, in our mobility ecosystem, um, we started thinking what makes sense, what else should we have here? And our colleagues in the field started saying, look, it was really interesting if we could uh, record the operations that we do and make them available. And so we started using, before, besides of the videos, speech-to-text recognition. We are now implementing speech-to-text speech -to uh, features in, in our devices so that when people do a work order, they can speak and it gets in, um, automatically inserted into the system. Those are some examples of what we've been doing, some of examples of the projects that we've been doing in our digital transformation journey. But I think that technolo technology is not the only part of it. Technology can be the easiest part of it because we can buy it. 
the trick is how do we implement it? How do we make sure that the people who have to work with it believe it and make sense of it? And so we partner. The way we did it, and to us it's what makes sense, is that we work in close collaboration with our teams in the field, with our colleagues that tell us what they need. And why do we do this? It's simple. We want people to use their brain power to more value-added activities. We don't want them to spend much time doing administrative stuff. We want them to do activities that are more interesting for them and that create more value for us, because that will make them happier. That will make them more engaged uh, in their work. And for me, that's the real game changer, is that people love what they do because happy people achieve more and happy teams achieve much more together. Thank you. <laughs>